Hi, Lakeview. Uh, Mrs. Lennon here, back to continue reading the one and only Bob. Last time we read, Bob was able to get out of the flooding animal shelter with his sister, Boss, with the help of Ivan and Ruby. Well, once they escaped, or not escaped, but got out, um, Boss was really worried about the puppy she had left behind. And so Bob spoke up and said that he would brave the storm and go and check on her puppy. Ivan and Ruby followed, or went with him to kind of help him out. But the police saw them and were really worried about a gorilla and an elephant in the middle of the street. So Bob had to continue on without him. And the last we read, uh, he spotted the puppy waiting on top of the car. So now we're going to see what happens to see if Bob can get this puppy to come with him. Those of you reading along at home, we're on page 295, and this little part is called Another Bridge. The creek is filled with pieces of trees, boards, trash cans, plastic chairs, everything you can imagine. It's moving way too fast for me to try to cross. I stare at the far side of the creek at the collapsed bridge. I really wish I hadn't seen that puppy. I know there's another way to cross the creek, of sorts, downstream a bit. An old pedestrian bridge made of wood and metal and rope. No one uses it anymore. No one with any sense. When I reach it, the little bridge is swaying like a cradle. It's blocked off by a rusty metal gate to keep people from using it, but I can easily squeeze through the bars. I run halfway across, lose my footing, run some more. Whoop! what am I doing? A fresh gust pushes the bridge with such force that I slip. Half my body is dangling off the edge. I dig my claws into the wet wooden slats, and oh, am I glad my nails are long and sharp because I fight off Sarah's clippers whenever I can. Pulling, pulling, pulling. Man, I wish I hadn't eaten so much cheese over the years. And then, umph, one last effort, and I'm back on the bridge. It feels good, so good, to return to that little stretch of swinging slats. I want to live. Really, I do. I don't care about the puppy anymore. I just don't want to die this way. Not like this. The fear's in my throat, my heart, my gut. I've got to get off this rickety bridge. Get back to Ivan and Ruby. Back to my wonderful Bob smelling bad. I'm not a hero. Never have, then never will be. I can live with that because at least I'll be alive. I turn moving snail slow because the stupid bridge just won't stay put, crawling on my belly so I won't lose my footing again. Almost to the end, I glance back like a fool, just in time to see the car with the puppy lurch loose from its mooring in the tree, swirling into the middle of the creek like a toy boat in a bathtub. The puppy isn't howling or anything. He's just lying on his belly, same as me, waiting. What a nincompoop, I think yet again, and I'm honestly not sure whether I mean him or me. Hero, I will not lie. I am not thinking, oh, yay, now I get to be a hero. Nope. I'm thinking, you have got to be kidding me. Just a few more seconds and I would have been out of here. I may or may not use a few other choice words, way worse than anything that Jay came up with. Then I run back to the middle of the bridge and wait a split second, maybe two, maybe three, and I jump. Cartoons. And I ain't proud of this, but halfway down, I remember that I really, really, really don't like riding in cars. I'm sort of dog paddling the air, thinking I can slow things down, maybe even reverse direction like Wild E. Coyote in some of those old cartoons. Cartoons are ridiculous for a reason, not a movie. So in a movie, I'd land all graceful and tough and grab that little guy. But this isn't a movie. I kind of land on top of him. Legs splayed like a bug on a windshield. Not enough to smoosh him, but definitely enough to annoy him. The car spins, dips, rights itself. Hi, I say, I'm your Uncle Bob. If you're my uncle, why are you trying to kill me? He asks. Pup has a mouth on him for being so tiny. I'm saving you, dude. I grab his scruff with my teeth. Ouch, he says. The car seesaws. I scrabble, clawing at the slick of skin on the roof, of the roof. My nails make a horrible scraping sound. It's like trying to hug a whale. Can you swim? I ask out of the side of my mouth. It's hard to talk with a puppy between your teeth. No, can you? Yes, but I suspect the degree of difficulty will go up considerably with a puppy in my mouth. The car lists, recovers, lopes along like a jackrabbit in tall grass. My claws make tracks in the paint. 
How'd I, how'd you get on top of the car? I asked. Wasn't easy. Branch broke through one of the windows. I climbed out that way. Impressive. By the way, says the puppy, I think we may be sinking. No kidding, Sherlock. I don't mean to sound unkind. I'm a bit stressed. I don't have a name, actually. How about Rowdy, I suggest. I hear it's available. Sure, what the heck? So what's your plan? You tell me, I say. What do you think was going to happen? I figured someone would come along and save me. Some human, maybe. Dog's best friend, I say. If you say so. Another lurch. We're going down. Hang on, pup, I say. Man's best friend is going to save you instead. Do not let go. The water's cold, so cold it burns. I paddle frantically. Nothing happens. It's like pawing air. I keep my teeth tight on Rowdy. Do not let go. Do not let go, I tell myself. But the water's churning into my, noose, my nose and throat, and if I cough, he'll be a goner. We hit something hard and metal straight on. I'm underwater, submerged, as bits and pieces of the world rush past. It's like the tornado, only wetter. I dig at the darkness. I think of all the things I'll miss when I'm dead. Cheese tops the list. Well, okay, maybe Ivan and Ruby and Julie and George and Sarah top the list, but then totally cheese. My back paws graze the bottom. My nose burns. My lungs burn. Everything burns. I have to cough. I can't cough. Mustering all my strength, I struggle to the surface for a moment, biting the water with my paws. Rowdy is dead weight in my mouth. I hit bottom again, and this time I use it like a springboard, lurching toward the edge of the water, toward solid land, toward grass and dirt and trees and bushes and... A whoosh of fur and pain. Oh man, the pain. Someone grabbing my paw, losing it. Teeth, sharp, sharp teeth. The smell, even with my messed up nose, of wildness and danger. Something grabs my scruff, yanks, pulls me to safety. Back to the world, back from the brink. Kimu again. Kimu has me. He drops me to the mud. His teeth smell of blood. My blood. I drop rowdy. My teeth smell of blood too. For a long time, no words come. Just panting, coughing, panting some more. Nothing from the puppy. I shove him with my paw, nudge him with my nose. Nothing. I look at Kimo, his fur spiked, his eyes wild, different, unknowable. I guess they didn't shoot you, I say. They tried, he says, eyes on the puppy. Thank you for, I trail off. He glances at me. Didn't do it for you, a pause. Did it for me. With his right front paw, he claws at the puppy, at Rowdy. Hey, I say without really thinking or registering the size of his paw or realizing that he's drooling just a little. He, uh, I put my paw, my puny, pathetic loser paw on Rowdy too. He's my, my nephew. And while I didn't take you for the sentimental sort, Bob, I'm not just, you know how it is. No, actually, I don't know. I'm a wild animal, not a pet. Still, I clear my throat and remind myself that rolling over and peeing myself is not an acceptable option. Still in all, he's scrawny, might even be dead. Who knows? You got better breakfast at the park. I recognize all too well the look he gives me, the look of sadness and loss and anger, the look of someone who will never forgive the world. He's running with the puppy, dangling from his jaws before I even know what's happened. How? I don't know how I do it. If I did know, maybe I could understand that other part of me, the wolf part. I run faster than I've ever run. I growl louder than I've ever growled. I grab Kimu's throat. I clamp down. I do not let go. Gone. He can kill me. With a sidelong glance and a half-hearted bite, he can kill me. I know that but he doesn't. He drops the puppy. He shakes me off and pulls free. He pauses, looks at me like he's seeing me for the first time. He gazes at the sky, thick with clouds, no moon, barely any sun. He raises his head. His howl is long and sad and beautiful. He runs. First aid. Rowdy still isn't moving. I don't know what else to do, so I bite the heck out of his tail. Perks the little guy right up. the truth. It hits me then. I'm so tired, so banged up. I can't go on even if I want to. 
I carry Rowdy to a sheltering tree, cuddle him close, give him a couple of licks for good measure. Now what, he asks. Now, I say, we wait. For what? For humans, I answer, for help. Are you sure they'll come? I think for a moment. I remember all the people I've seen today, the police and rescue workers, the park employees, the staff at the shelter, the folks at the donut shop opening their door to strange collection of animals. I remember George running to get Julia and Julia trying to get me and Sarah struggling to find them both. I breathe in the sweet smell of puppy. It's important to tell the truth. I'm sure, I say. Forever. The eye of the hurricane passes. The storm rages on. It feels like a year, like nine years even. It feels like forever. Rescue. When I hear Julia calling my name through the open window of her parents' car, I pick up Rowdy and dash over like it's my favorite place on this lonely ball called Earth. No clickers necessary. No treats required. I fly my drool flag all the way home. Part four. This is the very end. Aftermath. We've lost 10 park residents total, eight deaths plus two still missing. No humans died, but there were some injuries. They've already started rebuilding. It's funny the way people go right back at it after a tragedy. Everyone comes together. Lots of talk about community and kumbaya, blah, blah, blah. They're a resilient species. I'll give them that. It's been three weeks and we still don't have Kimu back. Suzu either. They've been, there've been some sightings, nothing for sure. I worry they can't last long. Wolves aren't native to this part of the world. I think, I like to think they're together at least. Everybody else is back with makeshift domains. Nobody's complaining though. In spite of all the construction, Julia's been taking me to see Ivan and Ruby whenever she can. Today, Ivan leans on the temporary fence separating him from the elephants. Maya made him a medal for valor out of a watermelon and cucumbers. He's eaten most of it. It's pretty great almost everybody we saved from the shelter ended up with a home, says Ivan, even that annoying bunny. Almost everyone, I remind him. I'm so sorry about Boss, he says in his gentle way. From what we can tell, Boss never went into the donut shop. She slipped away and no one knows what happened to her. I try not to feel hurt, but I had this silly fantasy about me and her and Rowdy all hanging out together like a family. And I so wanted her to know what it's like to have a warm bed and a full bowl and a good ear scratch whenever you need it. I wanted her to know she deserves it as much as any other dog. I guess she'd live life too long on her own terms. Or maybe she was afraid to get her hopes up, to trust. I understand. Been there. Done that. But sometimes humans don't let you down. Sometimes they even come to the rescue. Riddle. Uncle Bob! Ruby calls galloping over. She seems more confident these days, a little more grown up. Stella would be proud. I know I am. Want to hear my new riddle? Absolutely, I do. Ruby flaps her ears. She does that when she gets excited. What has an eye but cannot see? I'm perplexed, Ruby, pondering and puzzled. A hurricane, she exclaims. Good one, Ruby. First rate. I look at Ivan. We smile at each other. We don't need to say anything. It's enough to listen to the palm trees rustle and watch the sawgrass away working on it. On the way home, we pass the shelter. It's been patched up pretty well, looks like, and they're back in business. I hear the usual yelps and howls and hisses and meows, and like always, I feel lousy. I plop down on the sidewalk, and Julia stops walking. What's going on, Bob? She asks. I listen, like I always do, for her bark. That bark. Nope, nothing. I wish Rowdy were here to distract me, but he's still learning how to walk on a tug-of-war string. He's a pretty well, swell pup, even if he is a little feisty. I'm surprised how much, surprised much I like having him around the house. It's weird. I feel responsible for the little guy. Sort of like he's become my numero uno. Julia bends down and strokes my head. I wag my tail a bit, slowly stand. I think of poor old Julia stuck in that backyard day and night. I think of Boss roaming the streets. I think of my siblings, the dark night, the box, the highway. I'm trying hard to find the forgiveness that seems to come so naturally to other dogs. Maybe that's what Boss was getting at. Maybe it's easier to forgive others once you've learned how to forgive yourself. I'm working on it. It's like a bone. Sometimes you have to chew for a long time before you make any progress. Snickers again. Once we're home, I head for the couch. I'm snoozing peacefully with Rowdy when a smell, a doozy of a smell, assaults my schnoz, which is finally back to working order. It's her. Snickers is back. She's been gone for a while. 
after the hurricane, they had to do some repairs on Mac's house. Not sure where Snickers has been staying, but that's definitely her smell. No doubt about it. I dive under the couch, but not before Nutwit appears at the front window. Oh, Babo, he calls. Someone's looking for you. I'm not home, I yell. Yeah, I don't think she'll take no for an answer, says Nutwit. Shouldn't you be rebuilding your nest? Nah, watching you cower in fear is way more fun. What's the deal, Uncle Bob? Rowdy asks. Be afraid, Rowdy, I say. Be very afraid. The door opens and there's Julia with Snickers by her side. Well, hello there, Snickers, says Sarah as she passes through the living room. What are you doing here? Mac and his wife just moved back in, Julia says. They called this afternoon and said Snickers was dying for a walk. I ease back a little farther under the couch. Can Snickers see me? Maybe not, but she can most definitely smell me. For once, I regret my pungent aroma. Snickers darts around the living room, straight across the couch, pulling Julia loud for the ride. Snickers, Julia exclaims. Slow down, girl. She kneels. Bob, are you hiding under there? I move an inch, exposing my snout. Snickers goes insane. She yanks free of her tug war string. For a moment, she pauses to do a polite nose tap with Rowdy. Then she lets loose with zoomies and yips and howls of joy. Bob, Julia says, come out and say hi. I pretend not to hear her, which isn't a big stretch since Snickers is barking like a maniac. Robert, says Julia. Fine, I belly crawl until I'm exposed. Snickers is ecstatic. She showers me with licks and nips and nudges and leaps. Bob, she croons, how I missed you. I cover my head with my paws, but there's no escaping her adoration. There's a reason we survived, Bob, she says, her fuzzy tail in high gear. The fates want our love to blossom. Is this your girlfriend, Uncle Bob? Rowdy inquires. Girlfriend today, Snickers responds in a giddy voice, but who knows what tomorrow may bring. Perhaps you should start calling me Aunt Snickers. I am relieved beyond measure when Julia finally pulls Snickers with great effort out the door. I try to ignore Nutwick's teasing. I try to tolerate Rowdy's stifled laughter. But when Minnie starts chanting, Bob and Snickers, followed by Moose, sitting in a tree, I've had enough. I head for my doggy door, ignoring the popcorn and guinea pigs, and try to locate my dignity. A visitor. This evening is a lot is like lots of other evenings. The guinea pigs are squeaking. Nutwick is, Nutwick is puttering in his tree. Julia and Sarah and George are watching something about meerkats on the Nature Channel. I've just settled in with Rowdy on the couch when George drops a cookie on the floor. I leap into action. Robert, says Julia, leave it. Briefly, I consider my options, but not for long. At least I share a piece with Rowdy. You are hopeless, Julia says, but I love you anyways. And that's when we hear the bark. It's coming from the front porch. Hmm, that's weird, says George. I'll check it out, Julia. I'll check it out. Julia runs to the door and pulls it open. She hesitates. She looks over at me, back at the porch, and back at me. Bob, she says, I think it's for you. And it is. And boys and girls, that is the end of our story. I was so happy to share this with you. And I hope that they come out or that Kath Catherine Applegate comes out with another book. I will miss, I miss you guys. And I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.